Welcome back, Billiken fans. It's Zach Miller and Peter Hale. This is the Midtown Madness podcast. Before we get going, thank you again so much for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button, as well as share the podcast, really, uh, with any of your friends that might be interested. Uh, That's how we grow. Uh, As you know, this episode and the whole season of the Midtown Madness podcast is brought to you by Two Men in the Garden. Whether you like it mild or hot, Chunky or cantina style, the people over at Two Men have you covered. I know we're getting into the heart of summer, and this is more pickle territory uh, given the heat outside. But, uh, you know, the good news with their salsa is they have it in varieties like mango, strawberry, peach, that real, that sw- cool, sweet flavor that really gets you through the summer. They even offer a sugar free version, and you can pick any of these up at your local grocery store or online at two men in a garden.com. Follow them on social media at two men salsa. And that's on Instagram and Twitter Uh, and stay tuned because we are revealing the bracket. I don't know how we talked ourselves into this, this shtick, but we are doing the most improved Billiken bracket uh, and we will reveal that at the end of our men's basketball segment. So stay tuned on that. Um, Pete, I decided to go a little topical with my background today because we got some Jordan Goodwin news. And I got to say, I didn't expect it. And maybe I should have. No, me neither. But, I, you know, honestly, I'm not sure you should have. Um, good Goodwin is... Well, it, it makes sense in a number of ways. Look, Goodwin is part of this trade, um, reportedly. It's not official yet. They're still waiting on a few pieces to fall into place, and we'll get into that. But but the big piece of the trade is Bradley Beal. Um, waived his no trade, trade clause so that the Wizards, the Washington Wizards, could send him, um, along with Jordan Goodwin and Isaiah Todd, to Phoenix for Chris Paul, Landry Shamet, several second round draft picks and a, and a pick swap as well. Um, and the reason this deal is going to take a few days to complete is the wizards are trying to get a third team involved so they can move Chris Paul to a contender. Um, so, so they're, they're, they're trying to send him along so they could sort of rebuild, use him as a, as a chip for rebuilding basically. And I guess the reason why it's, it's surprising Zach is because you just don't think of Goodwin, this undrafted guy, who kind of has been this nice story with the Wizards over the last couple of years, working his way up through their system to be part of, uh, uh, you know, you just never think of guys like that as the next piece of a blockbuster trade. But the reason it, it kind of makes sense is that now Beal becomes part of a, of a big three in Phoenix, right? With, uh, with Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton. And, and um, they're going to need a lot of league minimum guys to fill yeah. out the roster. And Goodwin makes perfect sense there, the way the way his deal is structured. I mean, he's he's productivity for for a pretty cheap price for the Suns, who have a lot of salary cap now tied up in just three players. So it's exciting for Jordan um, to be this role player on a team that wasn't a contender, and now he goes to one of next season's title favorites. Yeah, I think my th- I, I agree with what you're saying, and maybe that's why I should have. Uh, figured that out but also like the wizards are bringing in a new gm for this rebuild uh and he's got control over everything from what i understand and it makes sense that a a guy like jordan goodwin uh, an undrafted maybe unheralded would be the type of guy that he's got a year on his contract let's let's send him along to another team he's not our guy maybe he doesn't fit my style because again he's not he, he's not the type of guy that can fit on every team. He's that grimy go get, you know, you know, just stuff the stat sheet, do it however you can. Uh, and, and that's not necessarily every team. Every team's not the grimy team. Um, and then also, of course, you got the St. Louis connection. Uh, who knows if Bradley Beal was like, Hey, uh, this guy with me, like he's at the club, like waving him in with the, when the bouncer stops him. I like that. Yeah. Well, not, and speaking of club, he played for Brad's club team, right? Um, 
the, that's so the weird formerly that's known so as the Eagles. Weird. i know it is it is uh but you get that when you have veteran players in the nba who have aau teams named after them um it's only a few years before some of those guys actually hit the league um a little bit longer in jordan's case but just as cool regardless i mean i i, I think this is pretty exciting for him i mean we don't know what their final roster is going to look like yet. We don't know how he's going to fit into their plans. We don't know any of that kind of stuff. Uh, we just know that this is an opportunity to, to go play for a winner and to be one of those relatively cheap, you know, borderline league minimum kind of guys. In the NHL, um, you would call him Black Ace. The sure. guy that's, yeah. you know, he may not suit up every playoff game, but, uh, you know, if there's a scratch, you know. And, and and how many guys, I mean, that was the story around the Miami Heat this year, right, is how many guys on that team were undrafted, mm -hmm. um, guys who had found roles, guys who had worked their way up. It was like more than half of the, the Heat's roster who had kind of been undrafted and worked their way into the rotation, been really effective players for their playoff run um, that went all the way to the finals. So we've seen very, very recently, like, you know, what can happen if you've got the right core of players at the top and the right supporting cast around them, um, anything's possible. And 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 credit to uh, to to Goodwin for being in the right place at the right time, I guess. And and he's going to get a pretty cool opportunity here. I, I I hope he does get the same level of of minutes and, and opportunity that he did in Washington. Right. One one of the other the sort of the counters to the Zach is we talk about the reasons why he makes sense to take along to Phoenix, but. Or even, you know, with a, a new GM in Washington, why it makes sense to move them along so a new GM can bring in a crop of unknown, untested players that he believes in, you know, that he's got his stamp on. But at the same time, Goodwin's the kind of guy who he's, you know, we, we he's got that dog in him, right? Like, like to use that cliche and an undrafted guy who's who's worked his way into some minutes and become a little bit of a, a an underdog fan favorite for some of the hardcores in Washington. Um, I think he had kind of become that guy. So it's, it's a shame that though, that the people who kind of got a little bit of a connection to him there are going to lose out on that now. Um, so I, I, I hope the best for the new GM and what they're doing there. Cause that's a franchise that just hasn't won much ever. And, um, and, and at the same time, I'm even rooting harder for, for Jordan in Phoenix. You know, I know we're not a, uh, an NBA show and I, I think I don't make any secrets that I don't, Care for the NBA. It's just not my cup of tea, not my favorite basketball to watch. I don't have a team. I can't really get into it. Uh, but I thought this year's NBA finals, because I'll watch the, the the big events, like any sport, really. Like it could be like team handball. Is it the world championship? Sure, why not? Um, but I think this year was kind of a breath of fresh air. Uh, you had a guy like uh what Jokic? Is that it? That's that's right. Yeah, uh, and then and then of course. You have the Heat, who are like Jimmy Butler, like he was in Office Christmas Party. Like he not, <laughs> I mean, he was kind of a big deal in 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 Chicago, but like he really flew under the radar, partly because I think the Bulls just stink. Um, but yeah, like it's nice to see guys that aren't, you know, that aren't just superstars putting together a super team. Now I'm gonna enjoy watching a super team next year because. Our baby boy Jordan Goodwin's on the squad, so uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it'll be a uh, I think Billiken fans might enjoy a, a trip or two down to the Phoenix area uh, to take in a game in the middle of winter up here. Yeah, for sure. Two of my very good friends live out there. I, I don't think either of them listen to the show. Uh, shout out to Blake and Drew. They're not that good of friends, then. <laughs> Touche. Drew Drew was my freshman year roommate at SLU. And and he's out there, and then uh, and then yeah, my buddy Blake, who I met after college, is out there as well. But and Blake actually, he sold his kind. Of, he lived in the tower, the 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 condos across the street from the uh, Suns Arena. Mm. It was kind of like in between the downtown, the, the two downtown. Talking downtowns. Stick. Yeah, whatever. We, I guess that's what it's called stick, now, right? Yeah. Talking Stick Resort Arena. But but yeah, he used to live uh, right next to there, and then uh, moved a little bit outside of downtown. But regardless. I do have a place to crash if I ever do get a chance to get out there and uh, check out Goodwin. Um, I well, I assume I, I've got fifty fifty, right? Uh, I've got I've got a place to or, or two shots at it anyway. People to say yeah. no. Um, regardless, I, I'd like to get back out to Phoenix. It's been too long, and this is a pretty good excuse to 
to do that. You know, it's it's one of those things I really do hope they make the Suns do make some more noise next year in the playoffs. During the regular season, it seems like the coverage tends to really favor superstars and what they're doing and not doing and, and all of those things. Um, it's it's almost like the drama around the NBA has become more of the story than the actual games themselves. But in the playoffs, that kind of changes. And those guys like, uh, you know, your your Duncan Robinsons and, and dudes like that who you really don't have never thought about before all of a sudden become these kind of folk heroes and guys who every basketball fan eventually knows about. Um, and, and, and Goodwin kind of has an opportunity to to be that kind of guy, right? Like the right supporting player on the right team. Um, so I, I really would like to see them make a run next year. So he at least gets a shot to, to, to become that guy. If anybody would like to uh, sponsor a, uh, a Midtown madness field trip to Phoenix in the middle of <laughs> winter, uh, hit our DMS. They're open. Always uh, open. Yes. Always open. Um, Pete, this is something that hasn't been announced yet. It, it's kind of funny. Cause we really don't, wade into the waters of unconfirmed news and confirm it but i mean this is this is legit this is happening um the billikens uh have settled not settled i want to say settled but have uh picked a uh travis ford has rounded out his staff we'll put it that way uh pete and it's it's an a10 poach it and is. i say poach not coach yeah it's it's charles thomas from Duquesne. And if SLU's own directory is to be believed, um, SLU.edu's directory, Charles Thomas is in there as an assistant basketball coach. And and yeah, he's a longtime Keith Dambrod assistant who spent six years with them at Duquesne after seven years at Akron. They they actually met, um, da- Dambrod was an assistant at Eastern Michigan when Thomas was playing alongside his twin brother Carl there in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, both of them went on to play in the NBA, by the way. Um, I think they are one of nine, if I if I remember this little trivia tidbit right from his bio, uh, one of nine pairs of of brothers to play in the NBA. It's either, is it brothers or twins? Twins would be more. That I don't incredible. think there's any twin. Like, well, uh, I mean, Bro- what? Brooke and Robin Lopez yeah. for sure. Um, uh, Collins, right? Jason and John Collins. Yeah, the Zubac might be twins. I'm trying to think. Wasn't there a Duke, or was that just the Singler brothers? I did 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 Kyle Singler have a brother? Or wait, no. Who am I thinking of? Plumley. Plumley. Well, there were three Plumley bl- brothers, but they were all different ages. No. They were they like, yeah, me. it was like six years, you know, three brothers kind of thing. Um, but but yeah, while I'm looking that up, I mean, he is a, a longtime Dam Rock guy, right? And and this is just kind of a chance to kind of get a new start, I think. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, he played professionally for 15 years, a little bit, little bit of time with the Detroit Pistons like I said, in the NBA. Um, and then when he started coach or internationally, mostly for those 15 years, uh, he started out his coaching career at Radford and then at Northwood University in Michigan, um, you know, before moving back to D1. Hashtag that's rad. Yeah, that's, that's right. Shout out, shout out Jack Raboyne. I'm shout still trying to make that happen. I just, that's I want to make, I want to make this random teams hashtag that like, I just want the podcast to come up with it. Sure. Like, I, I just I, I think that'd be hilarious. It would be great. It would be great. Will it into existence? Absolutely. Um, and he's originally from Dayton, Zach. So he 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 does cover a lot of the sort of I would call it the Western A10 map, really, because we talked about we want an A10 guy, like an East Coast guy, geographically speaking, for this last hire. It would make a lot of sense. Get somebody from New York, DC, Virginia, somewhere along that 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 line, right? Um I think this more or less does it. He's, he's his roots are really Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Chicago, but I think that kind of kind of gets us there, right? I mean, it, you, yeah, we're not into the heart of A10 country. This guy isn't from Philadelphia or something, but um, we're but out here been, with Kevin Costner dances with wolves of the of the A10, the the Western Outpost, um, yes. yeah, across the Mississippi with our big wooden gate that you got to get through. But but so so yeah he he's like uh, I I still think he's kind of more or less in that right pocket there, and I'm totally fine if he's going to be recruiting Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, Pennsylvania. If if that's if that's his territory, if that's what he's going to bring us, I think that's fine. I think that kind of gets us there. 
um, you know, without necessarily being somebody who's truly in an A10 uh, market where all his connections are. Um, so I, I think this is great. I, you know, all, all the all word is that he's got a good eye for talent. Yeah. Um, you know, like, keep in mind that Duquesne was picked to finish last in conference last year, and they were a 20 win team. Yeah. And um, it may not have been against a very strong schedule, but they still won 20 games and they weren't supposed to. And and a lot of that is is the assistants get this credit for for cycling in players in this era of transfers and NIL the right mix of players, the right level of talent to help them win. And we said it last year, nobody in the league looked like they were having more fun playing than Duquesne. I mean, they had some really fun. And we were having zero players. fun. That, yeah, that's right. And they it looked felt a, a like, honestly, we had wins, but it felt like that t- our team was just not having fun. We lost to the wrong teams at the wrong times last year, for sure. I mean, there were there were some some pretty heavy blows, and and in the meantime, they were outperforming expectations. And and I think you know, an assist a a, a, a top level, long time loyal assistant um, who knows how to go get talent, um, I think had a big part of that. Mm-hmm. And and I I think this is the right profile for what we needed with this with this third spot. Yeah, I agree. I think it's funny because we got a tip that it was it was an A10 coach that we were going to we were going to hire and of course in my infinite amount of time I spent sitting on the couch uh I decided to go for a look and I actually wrote off Duquesne uh because of the long history each assistant had with him mm-hmm. and so I was shocked I actually uh I think I had a guy from GW uh but or a guy from Dayton as well uh but I think this is super important because you mentioned the eye for talent and we're talking about, you know, we're getting into the Billiken victory fund and the, the cluster Charlie Foxtrot that is the NIL and, you know, can we compete with NIL? No, we, we, I don't think we can. That's just the mm-hmm. facts. Um, and a guy like, I think it's it's very smart to bring in guys like Harry, like this guy who who are touted as eyes of talent, like that can find those diamond in the roughs. You look at, you know, you had, you know, other guys on that Majera staff, but Harriman was on a staff that was primary lo- primarily looking for guys that are flying under the radar that love to play the game of basketball and love to work hard and are smart. And and that is how we're going to have to win, at least in the short term, because they, you know, we're not going to outspend uh, on NIL. I mean, a, a VCU I think would outspend us a Dayton because they're such a small market and their 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 fan base is so rabid. Um, I think we. I don't know if we can. Um, I would imagine we have bigger benefactors, but not. Uh, the the sheer amount they do so i really do i think fi- these guys that are good at finding under the radar time is going to be huge for us going forward yeah i think so i think that's all absolutely true and um you know bonus points if he can do it kind of in in areas mm-hmm. that are going to be places where we can get people to st louis places where their families can go see him on the road all of that good stuff by the way zach i did look it up too um, it is the the stat was twins. He and his brother Carl are one of nine sets of twins to play in the NBA. Um, I think I've got most Muggsy of the rest Bogues of them. and Manute Bowl, right? Right, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, Horace and Harvey Grant, Ooh. uh, Jason and Jerron Collins, Brooke and Robin Lopez. Um, that's so so we've got four of them, right? Uh, Marcus and Markeith Morris, ah, yeah. Tom and Dick Van Arsdale, <laughs> um, Caleb and Cody Martin. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a, a man and I can never, I never say his brother's name, Osar, Usar Thompson, who are playing right now. Oh, okay. That, that makes sense that yeah. they're playing. Cause I'm now, I'm like, who? Uh, like, yeah. I, I, it's the brother that I always forget about. I knew about a man Thompson. Um, so yeah, so there, there are nine different sets to have played in the NBA and, and they're one of them. Um, and, and yeah, so, so anyway, there you go. There's your, there's a little bonus trivia for you today. Um, Pete, this next uh, item on the list uh, will mark the point where we know more about this player than we did about Daniel Rivera. 
I think you're probably right about that. Now, uh, this is a walk-on who, with little to no fanfare, has made it on to the Billiken social media pages. Uh, but I guess not on the roster. One of the funny things about the offseason is they'll throw up a workout video and you sort of, you you put your, your face way in there, right? Mm -hmm. And you're kind of looking at like, Oh, wow. You know, like, oh, yeah, yeah, they're not kidding. Uh, uh, he does look taller. Yeah, that guy has put on 15 pounds of muscle or whatever. Yeah, that dude's you, definitely like not that. seven foot tall. Right. Or, or, and then you start seeing your new recruits like, okay, cool. He's on campus now. He's on campus now. We saw a guy, a, a big, clearly a big with long, cur- kind of moppy, long curls past the, you know, the top of his ears. Looked like me, my sophomore year of high school. <laughs> I, I never could get curls like that. Oh, I got, I got the curl curls, but they, they never got the girls. That was my downfall. <laughs> well, I guess it doesn't help when you're like, you know, 81 pounds or whatever. Right. I was, I was, uh, it's funny you say that. Cause I was like four foot 11, my freshman year of high school. Not even kidding. Yeah. I, 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 I think I remember that with glasses. So obviously I was raking in the ladies. Yeah, form an orderly line. I was, I was, I was Heisman posing all of them, Respe- <laughs> respectfully, respectfully. Right, of course, of course. So we 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 look at this guy and we're like, is that is that Steph? Is that the 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 kid from the Netherlands uh, that we talked about a few weeks ago? He didn't grow his hair out all of a sudden, did he? And we're like looking, freezing the video, looking at a picture of him. Like I don't know if that's him or not. It might be. This is kind of a weird angle. And uh, of course it's not. We find out it's Alex Noakes, a 6'8". He's listed at 218 pounds forward from Victory Rock Prep in Florida, where um, where, where we did get Markai Strickland. And uh, who, who else was out of there? Traore? I think it was oh, Traore that came out of there. Jesus. But, you're, the, um, you're the expert on that one. Yeah, so two guys recently came out of there. But he's originally from California. He actually appears to have played at four high schools in four years in California, Oak Park as a freshman, Santa Monica as a sophomore, Brentwood as a junior, Beverly Hills as a senior. So um, he gives you the whole tour Jesus. of LA um, over his high school career. I, I have no idea what's behind the the moves, the transfers there, anything like that. I would um, I would bet money that uh, uh, Austin McBroom went to one of those schools. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to take you up on that because he very well may have. I know. Uh, who, Tanner Lancona, the other South That's Southern California right. kid, okay. he came from Santa Monica, something. Okay. No, or, um, no, 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 no. He was ran, Rancho Cuco. Uh, what am I? Th- Rancho Cucamonga or something. Yeah, like that. that well, famous cameo in the movie Bring It On. Okay, yeah, yeah. that I think I think Lancona went there. And Austin uh, but, went to Campbell. Not that it. Yeah, uh, he he uh, he's the kind of kid who would go to four or five schools in four years now, though. I just don't know how you do that. I I don't know what's up with it either, because these are also schools like I've been to L.A. enough to know these aren't all right by each other. You know, this is it's kind of odd. It's like it's like going from like Oakville to then like Fort Zumwalt West, yeah. you know, to then like Granite City. It, like it's like he's moving way like all across the uh, the L.A area which is obviously much bigger than st louis but what's interesting though is you don't often see forwards as walk-ons yeah or at that's least not true. at SLU. well and, and and i'm thinking back to like my era and we had a lot of guys who were kind of like six three to six five right like guys that could do that could if they needed to play big they you know right so they were kind of like they probably played more like power forwards in high in high school and then in college you can't really do that and they're not really like ball handlers right although one of them ian mooney actually did get some decent yeah. minutes at texas yes he later did on, play in he was a final bit four, right yeah yeah and um and and yeah we had you know we had a few other guys in that kind of range but yeah you're right i mean it's it's a little odd um, to to have somebody who's six eight on campus this early as a walk on, it, it it gives them kind of that sort of preferred walk on uh, vibes, you know. Like I guess Larry Hughes was technically that for us last year. Not, not that he's going to play that many minutes for us, like Hughes yeah. did. But um, but schools will bring in walk ons, you know, without a tryout process ahead of time. Um, in a lot of cases, and it, it kind of feels like that's probably 
what he is in this instant. But yeah, we're and we're happy to report it is not Steph von Busel and that he actually is on campus now. He has subsequently showed up on campus and was able to celebrate his birthday here uh, already as well. So everything's fallen into place. I had to laugh. First of all, I, I thought you said Steph, Stefan Busel. And then I realized you said Steph Van Busel. I was going to yeah. give you shit. And then I realized that, no, you just said Steph Van Busel. <laughs> I think hey. I'm saying it right, too. I, you know, uh, my, my I, wife, I just, I go My wife spent uh, a few months out there for what was called an externship when she was in law school. And uh, so kind of got those Dutch pronunciations a little bit. But yeah, I'm rusty. It's been 15 years. I had to, I had to laugh at the, um, at the, the pictures they posted from the white room. Yeah. And like Travis Ford is there. <laughs> like, I, I like, I get, like, I, I get what they're going for, but like a head coach has never been involved with like that closely with a guy lifting right. in the history of college basketball. Maybe, maybe John Wooden is standing next to the guy with the, with the pommel horse thing with the, with the band. Yeah, maybe that that's about the last time a head coach was probably involved in lifting. Well, back when they didn't have full staffs and strength and conditioning yes. coaches and stuff like that. But yeah, now it's, it's generally if the head coach is walking in there, it's on uh it's with a recruit, right? Like uh, touring the facilities or something that are getting on the Stairmaster or, right. you know, we're doing their own workout. They're doing their own workout after hours. Right. Yeah. Like Pat Kelsey, he would be lifting. Well, that's right. Yeah. 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 Um, let's talk about some new offers because, uh, the open period just started and this is the first open period of 2025. Well, it's the first period, uh, you know, as of the 15th, it's the first time when coaches can directly contact, uh, members of the 2025 class, um, at the same time. Yeah. an open period, they, they, they've already been able to contact the 2024 class and we'll start with a couple of those. Um, but but they've also been able to con contact the guys who just finished their sophomore year directly, June fifteenth, uh, rising juniors as they call them. But 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 Zach, the the offer that came in today, Sunday, as we record this, is kind of the one that that's the most interesting to me because this is a kid, he's from the St. Louis area and he's not there anymore, and now of course he's blowing up, and that's Darion Sutton, who is a twenty twenty four player. Um, I think he was originally twenty twenty three and reclassified um, before transferring. He's playing out in the Denver area at a school called Accelerated Prep, uh, which is on the grind ses session national circuit. It's not accelerated. Look, it's not like a, an Oak Hill or La Lumiere or one of those schools that's a lot more established and has kind of, you know, tacked on a, a, a nationally competitive basketball program. It is a, a newer um, sort of sort of, you know, prep school. And and I don't know a whole lot about it, so I, I will kind of give that uh, um, that caveat there. But uh, but regardless, they play on the grind session. Same, so Hillcrest, where um, Jimmy Bell went, same deal. They played on that as well. Um, he's playing for Young and Reckless AAU team, which is that's uh, out so of Chicago. funny to me. I know that's yeah. that's the Rob Deerdeck brand. It, yeah, they literally they... use the logo. It's this, I don't know if, yeah, it's one of those things too. I don't know like how many high schools around the country just flat out use a college or pro logo. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is a case of that or if he's like, yeah, I'll throw a few bucks at an AU team. No idea. I don't think they're on one of the shoe circuits though. I think they just play um, independent events, but regardless, we've, we've recruited this program before and it's based in Chicago, but he's from O'Fallon, Missouri, and he was actually homeschooled. So he played high school ball for a couple of seasons with what was called Gateway City Elite, which is like a Christian athletic program for homeschooled kids. I can't imagine the level of competition that he's playing with that program is anywhere near what he would get somewhere else. But instead of going to like a CBC or a Chaminade or a whatever school in St. Louis, he just moved right on to a, uh, you know, a national prep school. Um, but so it, it's, it's kind of a bummer that he didn't stay local, but regardless, he's one of the most unique talents in this entire class. Um, I've been wanting salute to offer for a long time. I know he's been on our radar because, you know, Tate and, and others have been following him on Twitter, um, since he was a lot younger and he really didn't have the attention. He, it wasn't just that he was playing for this, um, this homeschool program, basically. He was also playing for AAU teams that, you know, 
weren't on shoe circuits, didn't get much attention. And I know he's not in the UIBL or anything right now, but like a couple notches down. Um, and so I've been really wanting us to offer for a long time. Now he's grown to about 6'10". He's long, he's lean, but he plays with like a guard skill set. He thinks of himself as like a 2-3, like a wing, right? Um, he can handle the Victor ball. Victor Wembayama out here. Yeah, you know, all he needs to do is grow six more inches. Um, he, he's he's So he's got those guard skills, right? He can handle it, pull up and shoot, break down defenders off the dribble. He gets to the rim. Um, he can pass it a little bit, but he's so big and long that at the other end, he's like rebounding, blocking shots. He's got great footwork. The best comp I've seen so far is Lamar Odom. If you can kind of remember what he looked like as a younger player, high school, college player at Rhode Island. Um, that's kind of what he looks like. Um, but, but, you know, he's, he, I think he's, he's like raw, but polished at the same time. And I think you're, when you're that long and lanky, you're just going to kind of look like that. As far as I can tell, Zach, uh, uh, as as of today, my count is that he has 34 offers. I don't know the if Jeff those are Harris all. Jeff Harris number of offers. Yeah, no kidding. Committable right now, I don't know. Um, but I have to think that he's going to get more because his trajectory has been incredible. He's been one of these kids who was just starting last fall to kind of get some attention, um, nationally speaking, and – and now he's just absolutely blowing up. I mean, he's he's really been incredible at AAU events. There's a, there's a clip of him dunking on one of the top prospects in the country, uh, the kid from Indiana whose name I'm 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 it's escaping me right now. Um, but but yeah, dunking on him uh, after you know that'll that'll blow you up on the TikTok. It will it will it was it was all over social media when it happened a couple of weeks ago. So um, so look, Slew's hope is being late with an offer like this to, to, to a guy who's now got power conference all, offers all over the place. He's, he's visiting Creighton this week. I know um, the, oh, the hope God. is we that, saw you that, can, before. that you can get him to come back home, you know, and that that's a compelling part of the pitch. So I'd also like to think like Tate and others have a long relationship here and that the offer is more of a formality, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I would have liked to see, us getting that uh, getting that across to him at some point last year instead of doing it in the middle of 2023. But regardless, really interesting player. He's a solid four star right now. It continues to rise. I, I could see him being a top 50 kid when it's all said and done. So um, definitely want to keep an eye on. I feel like we haven't had a Chicago recruit in a while, and it looks like we're actually focusing on that a little bit. Which is interesting to see with Will Bailey moving on and and nobody necessarily on the existing staff with super obvious Chicago ties. You, you got to wonder if this is, um, may, you know, maybe Thomas's influence here, you know, the new coach coming in. But I, I, I don't know for sure yet. This one doesn't have obvious uh, fingerprints on it like some of the other offers do. But yeah, this this kid's a name. Uh, his name's J Daniel Johnson. He's a 2024 recruit. Um, not to be confused with the late great Daniel Johnston, uh, but but he's from Chicago. He attends Brewster Academy, or I should say, will attend Brewster in New Hampshire this fall. He actually graduated from Whitney Young High School before reclassifying and announcing his post grad year. So he could have been a 2023 recruit, basically. Um, and it looks like Slew's the first to offer since he announced that. So um, that kind of gives an, an insight to where his recruitment might be going. He plays for the Illinois Wolves um, AAU team on the Under Armour Association circuit. He's he's basically a six seven wing, athletic, you know, sound, nice mid range game. He's got a, a you know good head fake, one dribble pull up mid range thing, kind of like a, a Jimerson. He likes to go to his right and do that, but he gets to the rim well too. I mean, he's got a good frame. He's a little under two hundred pounds, listed at like one ninety in most places, but good shoulders, strong. He looks like he's ready to play college physically, I would say. Um, he's got some other offers, but they're all from before he reclassified. Bonaventure, DePaul, Illinois State, Nevada, Akron, Toledo, and Northern Illinois are those offers. Um, you know, some of those schools had coaching changes or other things happen um, since the offers, and, and he reclassified. So I don't know how fresh any of those are, if he could actually take them up on one of those in the spring. Guess we'll find out, but um, but in the meantime, Slew has offered since he's become a 2024 player, and uh, and yeah, he's a solid looking player. 
I think we were wondering what was going on locally because we hadn't heard a lot uh, locally, and then we hear about uh, we hear about Sutton, and this other one. It, it, this this is a really intriguing player, and I'm kind of excited about this one because I think he's he's obviously local, but I think he's a, a Billiken fan. Yeah, and his name is Luke Walsh, and he, he's a kid that a lot of us have been keeping an eye on um, for sure. I mean, part of it is look, my, I've got an MCC bias. I still follow Shamanad closely so i i know kind of the the players at SLU and viani and the smet and cbc um he's on a pretty good young core viani team that his dad actually coaches um so so they're an interesting team and at viani last season he scored 18 and a half points a game shooting over 39 percent from three and it's the shooting that really is what stands out on this kid he, he last year he was listed at 6-1 right now for brad beal elite He's listed at 6'2". I think that's about right. Um, but, he, but Zach, he will just straight up pull pull up and shoot from anywhere. I mean, his range is unbelievable. He's a really good uh, three-point free throw shooter, just a, just an absolute sharp shooter. Um, and and then if, you, if he can get open on the catch and shoot, he's an even more effective shooter than he is off the pull up. He's not really a point guard. Um you know, if you look at at the way Viani played last year, it was definitely kind of a guard heavy um, system. They move the ball around a lot, um, so so it's not like they they don't have like a, a Yuri who's got ten assists a game, but uh, but yeah, he's he's definitely a, a scoring guard, not not a point guard. Um, and for Brad Beal, he's he's averaging thirteen point eight points a game. You know, this AAU season, he's actually shooting over forty percent from three. He's hit a couple game winners. Um, just been really, really effective for them. Uh, I, I like him a lot. Look, if he, if he were a few inches bigger, he would have a totally different profile. You know, I think, I think you'd have Mizzou and well, Mizzou actually already is kind of sniffing around, but I think you'd have like K state and Kansas and some of the other, you know, bigger programs in the region, uh, probably being a little more aggressive with them. Um, they're certainly circling, but you know, the, the offers that he's got at this point, George Mason, although I think that was when English was still around and recruiting Missouri. Uh, Missouri State actually just offered this weekend. And then he's had um, Lindenwood, SEMO, Texas Arlington, and Louisiana Monroe offer. Um, so look, Missouri State's the latest one to, to, to jump in a few days after SLU. But I think SLU is the strongest on paper at this point. Um, we'll see if he grows anymore. We'll see if he kind of adds more of a total guard package to his game. But his shooting is undeniable. And, and I think there's, for, for a kid who can do that, um, I think there's going to be a home for him at, at, le- at the very least as a role player um, at a place like SLU. Yeah, I think guys like, <laughs> I'm going to say this out loud. I think guys like Luke Walsh and Gibson Jimerson. No, well, guys like Luke Walsh, you know, watch Gibson Jimerson and it's representation. It's uh, not only the obvious, but again, it says, Hey, I can go in there as a sharpshooter and working with this coaching staff. And if I put in the effort, I can get where Gibson Jimerson is. Yeah. And, 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 and look, I don't want people to think they're the exact same player. Cause, cause Jimerson came in three plus inches taller than Walsh is right now. Right. Um, but, um, but with his range, you know, that kind of, uh, it kind of gym. solves for some of that. Right. I mean, um, if you can shoot like Steph Curry, uh, you can be small like Steph Curry. Um, you know, Austin McBroom, Zach pod favorite. He's come up twice now. He was under six feet tall. Uh, yeah. Walsh is already a few inches taller than he, uh, was. And, and he was a, as, as much as I hated the kid, um, a really good three point shooter. There, there's going to be a spot for him somewhere. I just want to see kind of what he becomes. Right. And, um, and yeah, you're right. He's a local kid. He's at a Catholic school. It's kind of a natural thing that he'd have an eye on, on the program. Uh, you know, he's a coach's kid and all that good stuff. Uh, he plays alongside spoon hours, grandson, I guess, Jay spoon hours, son, if I have that right. That's correct. Um, assuming he's still at Viani. So, so, uh, so yeah, there, there's definitely some slew, uh, DNA with this one and uh, and we'll, we'll see we'll see how his trajectory goes but I, I think any kid who scores almost 19 points a game as a sophomore 
in a really competitive league like that um, and, and who's going out and scoring double digits in the Nike EYBL circuit. I mean, come on, you know, like, like he, he's, he does something that is valued everywhere, uh, no matter what his height is um, or what the rest of his game is. So, uh, so yeah, this is one that we've been tracking and we'll, we'll continue to be keeping an eye on for sure. Uh, a little more A-10 backyard uh, recruit here. 2025 out of Dexter Southfield in Massachusetts, Pete. Yeah, this one's the most surprising because um, SLU is his first offer. Now, he's a, this is a Harriman recruit here, Zach. Um, he's, he's a 2025 kid named Sam Hughes. 6'6", good size shooting guard from Dexter Southfield School um, in Massachusetts. He does appear to have reclassified from a, the class of 2024. Um, and, and like I said, SLU is his first offer. He plays AAU for Expressions Elite, um, which is a Nike EYBL program based up in, uh, I think, Boston. Um, there's not a ton out there so far about him. Um, being a little bit, you know, some of, some of the Northeastern kids can fly a little bit under the radar until later. Um, but but he, he does look like a pretty good athlete from what I can find. And most of it is kind of a sophomore year highlight package that is on huddle. Um, I say sophomore year. That was his sophomore year at, uh, I think, Needham High School in Needham, Massachusetts, where he's from. Um, and then he, he appears to have reclassified and transferred. So, so I don't know if that means two sophomore years, two junior years, however you want to look at it, senior year and a post-grad year, that, that appears to be what he's doing. Um, he looks like fairly athletic. He's known as a shooter. He's got good size, uh, you know, roughly Jimerson size. Um, and from what I can gather, he's a pretty good defender as well. No other offers, but he's got interest from some other A-10 schools, couple conference usa mac the double a um ivy he's got i think three or four ivy league schools um kind of sniffing around and then a few others as well so um slew's definitely early to the party on this one and you know we'll we'll, we'll see what we can kind of gather uh, about him over time but so far he's definitely kind of the most mysterious out of any of the the names on this uh this new offer list harriman really is tireless He's tireless, Zach, and, and he seems to like to be the first one to really get in front of a player, right? Like like some of the European players are just guys you didn't see anything about in terms of their U.S. recruiting. And then all of a sudden we've offered or or they're committed. Um, and, and I think it is meaningful to a kid like this mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to be the first one in front of him saying, here we are in Atlantic 10 school um, and, uh, and and we've got an offer for you. So Again, we've talked about other recent recruits, um, not just Walsh, but some others who who are physically more like him, and they can kind of point to Jimerson and say, "You've got stature like this kid. You've got a skill that this kid has, and and here's what he's done over the course of four years," and uh, and that's a pretty attractive pitch for a, a so far lightly recruited six foot six kid. I feel like Harriman, just him as a person really it, it, he's made to be that guy that makes the first impression. Um, I mean, he's very much an Australian version of, in my head, he reminds me of Charlie Spoonhour, like very just, you know, down home, uh, you, you know, that, that's that draw that Australian draw mimics that Southern yeah. accent. Right. Sure. Um, and I just think he's very, you know, Easy going. Hey, brother, how's it going? You know? Yeah. And at the same time, he's a really good, he's really charismatic. Mm -hmm. He's a really good speaker. I could see like, like, look, this is, this isn't uh, a kid at a nice prep school in Massachusetts. Who's the biggest interest he's got so far is from the Ivy league. Like when, it, when a charismatic Australian comes in and is like, here are all the schools I've coached at. Here's where I'm at now. Here's some of the guys I've coached to have moved on to be pros. Um, here's what we can do with a guy like you. This is not a kid who's thinking I'm one and done, right? This is not a kid who's necessarily going to be chasing short-term NIL money. It, it's a much different pitch. And I think Harriman is, is in a unique, he's a unique appealing person to kind of have uh, be the one to go into somebody's house or, or, or school and make that an initial pitch, you know, to a Ge genuine prep school. Genuine nature is we are, it is, 
it is a going to be a major skill. Yeah. Not skill, but attribute. Yeah. It is going yeah, to be a sure. major attribute. Ge being genuine and being able to, you know, I, I don't think Harriman bullshits either. Um, right. Which is, again, uh, you're going to want to cut right through the shit. You're going to want to get to the guys that want to come for all the right reasons. They want to, they want to play it slew for all the right reasons. Um, and I think Harriman is that type of guy. And I think, again, that's why we liked the hire so much. Yeah, for sure. Culture is the, the one word, you know, tag on it. He's a culture guy. And, um, I, I, I can't think of a better, a better representative to get out there and, uh, and make that pitch to a kid like that. Um, let's talk transfers because this is, this is interesting. Uh, West Pine Bills called it, uh, Chandler Lawson, uh, out of Memphis, uh, transferring from Memphis is in the portal. Um, and as West Pine Bills would say to us, what, what, what's that Zach? Slew should pursue in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny because it, about what noontime. They they texted like uh, he texted that he was like uh, Chandler Lawson's in the portal. Slew should pursue, and then th not three hours later, Hitman Hoops Media tweets: Memphis forward Chandler Lawson has received interest from the following schools since hitting the transfer portal. Per source: Cal, St. Louis, DePaul, Santa Barbara, BYU, Arkansas, of course, and uh, South Carolina. Potentially, <laughs> we're hitting all the all the uh, West Pine Bills greatest hits. <laughs> It's you know what I think this is a burner account that they came up with, uh, just to say that they were right. Uh, potentially a Big Ten school too. What um, if what if the plot twist is that West Pine Bills by tweeting that they should pursue they are the source. <laughs> that's honestly in today's Twitter landscape, uh, that's very possible. But regardless, um, Lawson is a guy you know from Memphis. Look, a program we've played a lot recently. Um, well twice in the last two years um and because i know you were thinking about 2011 12 uh soccer too of yes all of all of the recent soccer and uh yeah all of it uh but but uh but yeah he began his career at oregon played two seasons there last two seasons at memphis and then um there'll be a grad transfer this year kind of like malcolm dandridge he put up about five points four and a half rebounds a game and he's got one year to play so they they were both at memphis put up similar numbers we actually saw kind of something on instagram that they were uh, i think lawson was giving dandridge trouble when he came back on campus and and uh and it was like uh oh there he is he's back and somebody read that to be oh dandridge is coming back to memphis but it, it was just more like no he's back on campus after after visiting some places including slu and um and Zach, I'm wondering your thoughts on this. Two guys from Memphis, two bigger guys, put up similar numbers. We've been after Dandridge for a while and still no decision out of him. Is this a genuine attempt at Lawson or is this a message to Dandridge? A little shit or get off the pot. Sure. Yeah, no, sure. I don't know. You know, I, I, I think it's whether, I mean, the offer to – uh, Chandler Lawson absolutely should be committable. Um, yeah, but I, I, I do wonder if maybe it's a little, Hey, Dandridge, make a decision, buddy. We don't have a lot of time. Right. Yeah, so, no, little, I, I think so. Him. Yeah. And they're a little bit, you know, they're a little bit different kind of player. Um, I, I think they were looking at Dandridge to kind of be the, the, the guy that they build the defense around, right? Like he's, he's a big dude in yeah. the middle. Um, you know, kind of a, a true five. I think Lawson's a little more of a four um, at the A-10 level. He's like six, seven, two, fifteen. Uh, he's long, kind of, kind of wiry, really kind of skinny. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but he's a different player than Dandridge. So I don't think, I don't think he's the kind of guy who you pitch as like, Hey, we're going to put you in the middle and build the defense around you. He's, he's a little bit different than that. Um, so, you know, look, um, I think Slu has a use for both of them. Um if if they want to use as a Wiro more as that kind of starting five and and then go a little bit more athletic at the four with Dalger and and Lawson, I could see that. Um, it's it's unquestionable that they're going for size, athleticism, and depth in the front court. 
Um, three things that we've kind of been lacking in recent years, uh, just going with centers, basically. So, look, I, I I would take either of them. They 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 both make sense to me. Maybe on paper, I think Dandridge might be a little bit more um, what what we had in mind, but yeah, I, absolutely, I think it should be committable. I I agree with you there. Um, I want to get to these rule changes in college basketball, but I feel like we should talk about. Uh, another rule and the rule is when peter's back in st louis he always gets two men in a garden <laughs> it's funny you say that zach because um let's see about uh 36 hours ago i i was there and i was at uh schnooks in richmond heights this I know, dude doesn't I know. call me unbelievable look i ghosted everybody this weekend i i was back with my family and i had family obligations and it just wasn't happening <laughs> okay for the listener zach has has gotten up and removed his headphones but yeah um look <laughs> look that's i i did the most important thing though zach and, and that's on the way out of town we stopped at the schnooks on clayton and richmond heights and uh i picked up a little bit of salsa they didn't have a lot i'm gonna be honest with you they only had two schnooks on the has there. let me down yeah this this i mean they had a, a lot of each but they only had the mild and medium of the regular salsas, the medium they had in white and green lids, um, which, which they did for when I saw it at Straub's, the cantina style that was, you know, not quite as chunky as the normal one had a white lid. And I thought that may have been what was going on, but I, I, you know, shuffled through a few of them and I didn't see that little sticker that kind of tells you like what's going on. Um, so it looked to me just to be the same thing, just with a different color lid. Uh, but regardless, they had a, they had a good stock of those two varieties, but that's that's all they had. They didn't have anything else at this one at at the moment. Um, so I grabbed a couple, and and yeah, you're right. Uh, I you you even though you didn't know I was in town, you knew that somehow telepathically you knew what I was doing in town, and that was picking up two men in a garden salsa at Schnucks, which you can do too if you're in the St. Louis area, or if not, you can go to two men in a garden dot com. You can pick it up online and they have $9.99 shipping anywhere uh, in the country, I think, except Alaska and Hawaii. So go go pick some up for yourself and uh, see what all the fuss is about. Pete, I'm going to selfishly start this off with the rule that I have been trying to implement for five years in college basketball. And yeah. that is that the second man to a loose ball on the floor if he touches the other player, it is a foul. I am tired of players on the floor being open season. It it really is, Zach. They like for for all of the things that they kind of call and call tight. That one is it, you're you're absolutely right. It's crazy. Like somebody jumps on a ball, and you're kind of like, okay, um, th this can only go one of a few different ways, and then somebody just barrels into him, and it, it's one of the most dangerous allowable plays in the game um that really kind of blows my mind like you can land on somebody's leg or back um in a way that's that's really damaging and um and i don't understand that it, it, most of the time it doesn't appear to be a play at the ball either i don't know if that's like what could distinguish the call if they were to implement that but so rarely does it look like that it just looks like a rugby scrum why i i am gonna go to brooklyn this year for the sole purpose of finding <laughs> Bernadette McGlade. Did she just resign, by the way? Did I hear that? Is that wrong? No. I, I, I've not I, I heard felt that like she just like moved on, but no, I don't think that's true. Um, no, I, I need to get this rule in front of you. I it's it's a crusade that I am now on. Uh I have committed fully. Um, I just I I don't like you when was the last time you saw a player get the ball and like pass it to a guy with like two hands? It's usually right. like kind of roll it out or like it's insane to like, right. You talk about, you know, the, the plays, you know, when you're defending one-on-one -on -one while dribbling, some of those fouls are child's play mm -hmm. comparatively. But anyway, let's talk about stuff that's actually happening. And of course we can't, <laughs> we cannot uh, go a, a season cycle of rules in the NCAA without talking. You guessed it, the block charge call, Pete. 
And, and tell me if this one makes sense to you, Zach. A defender would have to, this is the new rule, a defender would have to be in position to draw a charge at the time an offensive player plants his foot to go airborne to attempt a field goal. If the defender arrives after the offensive player plants a foot to launch toward the basket, officials would be instructed to call a block when contact occurs between the two players. A secondary defender would still have to be outside the restricted area arc to legally draw a charge. So that doesn't change. That makes sense. And I, and I, I now that I've read this out loud, I, I do think it makes a little bit more sense they're, to me. They're trying to push it further to yeah. Where they're ba- they're they're trying to push it to where it is impossible for you to draw a charge without standing there for a while. Right. Yeah. No. I, and I I think this is right too. I think I've I've for years been wanting them to go more in a direction where they're favoring the offensive player more than the defensive player. Right. So the defensive player would be more susceptible to the foul call. I think they call way too many charges. I think part of it is because it's fun to call charges. That is, that is, that is, that is not part of it. That is the whole thing. Right. Like, like they're out there. Like if, if I'm, if I'm going to have a highlight reel, my charge call is going to be on there. Oh, dude. It's like, (laughs) It's like Liam, uh, not Liam Neeson, Leslie Nielsen in, uh, in Naked Gun or whatever, when he's the umpire. Right. The strikeout call. <laughs> That's right. Man, going deep on those film references again. Yeah, working on it. So another one, an optional rule would allow for preloaded or live video to be transmitted to the bench area. This has been an experimental rule for the past two years, um, which normally means that they they use it in certain tournaments, you know, preseason NIT, things like that. Um, this is one of those that doesn't sound like a huge difference. Um, but over time, I wonder if it's one of those that will kind of seem like, oh, we never realized what a big development that was. Oh, it'll be everybody like it'll be nuts and then you'll start to get the like the the cheating here's where we cheat right here you just yeah. take it further i don't think it's good i think there are going to be teams that are using non-preloaded 100 percent. yeah pre yeah that's that's a good point i mean that's going to be that's going to be hard to police for can sure. you so can I you do wonder. first half can you reload it's at halftime it's a good question i don't know I, I we got this is this is Just one of those more, things more places for schools to have to spend money on coaches right next time we have an assistant on we got to act ask about how this is actually uh you know working um the third one officials would be able to review goaltending or basket interference calls during the next media timeout to ensure calls were accurate as long as the official calls it on the floor if there's a foul on the shooter while the ball is in the air with, with a goaltend uh, or basket interference, the review would be immediate yeah. to properly adjudicate the potential. Free I throws. like this. I like this a lot. I, and I think, and I think just like your, um, your take on the uh, block charge, I think this should, the, the ref should very much err on the side of that's a goaltend. Yeah, I think so too. And this is also where if it's a borderline call, it's one of those you got to get right. Yes. You, you can't have like a, a game decided on something that should have been a basket that wasn't a basket or vice versa. I think that's that's one you got to get right. This isn't like a, you know, a, a foul that's a judgment call, like how much contact is allowable, that kind of thing. I mean, this is really like a yes, no, like was yep. it a basket or not? You got to get it right. Um, Pete? This one is like, uh, there's so many of these rules that are just, uh, I don't know, they're gray areas. <laughs> I like the way this one is worded, though. Um, non-student bench personnel would be allowed to serve as peacekeepers when an altercation occurs. Assistant so, coaches, medical staff. Right. Non-student. So it can't be a student trainer, but if, uh, mm-hmm. you know, if, if a Tony Breitbach, for example, oh, if he's to- the head Tony's athletic throw, trainer, throwing it around and uh, if, he, if he wants to get a, if he wants to get out there and yes, you know, <laughs> he's finally got his moment. He's been watching the guys hold everybody back yeah. in the NCAA tournament. That's right. And now he gets to hold people back. He's, he's doing it like the, 
Yeah, that'd be great. No, he's he's moved on to bigger and better things. But uh, but yeah, you know, you're 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 non-student, right? So any any uh you know paid salaried coaches, trainers, etc., can be peacekeepers. That's interesting. I mean, I, you know, look, I it's not necessarily. I don't want to be in the. Is this the Anthony Grant rule? <laughs> Except he's the one who needs to be uh, restrained. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, well, that's I, why you know it's like uh, yeah that they name the rule after him because he's a violator of it. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I you know I don't want to be the the, the Jordan Jet rule, the grad assistant who's in the way of like a Hassan French haymaker or something no, like that. You know, no, no. I don't think people realize until you're actually out there how big those guys are, <laughs> how big and strong some of these guys are. So. Look, I guess, I guess a lot of the coaches were former players, but uh, hopefully this is one that leads to less fighting, suspensions, et cetera, and not more. You mentioned not realizing how big these guys are. Like, this is the first time watching the College World Series where these guys visually look like children. This is the first year to mm. me that college players just are children. Like, it's insane. You, you you've hit that age huh? I, I yeah i think there's a there's that much of a gap like um uh culturally mm -hmm. like the language is completely different i don't know what the hell they're saying <laughs> oh you're, you're you're in your 30s now man you're, it's you're, crazy, you're well dude. into it i know i'm see yeah I, i'm at the age where it's not only that but like i'm i'm just rooting for the last few pro athletes who are older than me to hang on you know adam wainwright Pitch until you're 60, dude. Just somewhere other than the Cardinals. <laughs> Be nice. Um, uh, I like this next one too, though, Pete. Under two minutes, when a coach requests an out-of-bounds play be reviewed, that team would be charged with a timeout if the original call is not overturned. Well, what happens if you don't have a timeout? You don't get the review. I get, yeah, I guess you. Or, or can't. would you call a two shot foul? It will. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess if if you want to review it, maybe if you don't get it, it's a technical. I agree. I like it. Yeah, I don't not know, a that... technical, but a two shot. I mean, but could that be? Could that be gamed? Like save time. Oh yeah, I'd have to think about that. It would have to be a technical. Right. It, That's it right. To where to, to where where you wouldn't get possession. Right. Because you could so you say you're down one and you know you're gonna have to foul anyway on the inbounds. Challenge every time. Yeah. So right. yeah. Yeah, that's know. a good point. Um, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Anytime the ball hits the rim and the offense retains possession in the front court, the shot clock would be reset to 20 seconds. This is the Billiken basketball rule. Why? Remember this happened? And I nobody understood why the shot clock didn't reset. It was a pass towards the rim. I don't I don't remember the play at all. It was uh it was like a, it wasn't a shot and it, the ball hit the rim and everybody's like, why didn't the clock reset? I don't oh, I it was see. a home game, that's all I remember. Anytime the ball hits the rim and the offense retains position, yeah. the shot clock would reset. Okay. So I didn't know, and nobody in the arena knew that it had to be a shot. They, okay. So they were just saying, yeah. So that what this rule does is say now something like that, like an incidental rim yes. uh, contact would still result in the, in it resetting the twenties, which I agree with. I think is the right thing to do. Yes. You know? It makes no sense that like, um, that there would be a differentiation. Well, and, and and it's better to have a rule based on something that does or does not happen and not intent, right? You know, like like a, a player could argue, no, that wasn't a pass. It was a shot or vice versa. Um, it, it removes that ambiguity. Um, I was thinking, I, I had another... Um, rule in my head that that just brought up and i can't think of it now um how about this next one oh it's this the two shot foul like i think you should get one shot worth two points that's my new thing one free throw yeah worth yeah. two points yeah if you get fouled huh. in the act of shooting it should be one shot worth two points or three 
Wow. So just I mean, it raise, makes sense, raising the right? stakes of the well, free Well, no, it throw. makes sense though, right? Because it's you're shooting already for three points. Now the the penalty for the other team for following you is that you have a free shot at making that same basket. Hmm. I bet players would not like that. No, not at all. Because they've gotten used to the extra downtime, you know, yes. from the the additional free throw. Having one free throw every time. I, I think a, the G a lot League. Less of a breather. The G League tried it. I don't know if it's still going. It's but... interesting. I wouldn't mind seeing a game play. I, like I I did a complete 180 on this. I hated it the first time I heard it. Then I thought about it and I was like, no, it actually makes sense because why would you trade one show? Like, why are you punishing the team, making them make three shots to get three points when they were trying to make one shot for three points? I don't sure. know. Yeah. Anyway, um, this next one is uh, all about flagrant fouls. If a player is called for a foul, an instant replay official see that the foul is a direct result of a flagrant one or flagrant two foul against the player who was originally assessed a foul, officials would be allowed to remove the foul on the player who was flagrantly fouled. The so, word foul is a lot in that, uh, appears a lot in that sentence. Um, yeah. Uh, I, so basically what this is saying is like, we're battling for a rebound. You hook and hold me. And then I, I hip toss you and right. you get called for the foul. I do not. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, um, I, th if, if this is what you're saying and, and how I'm reading this, I, I think I like this. I think this makes sense. Yeah. Like, like I'm like, if you elbow me in the face and then I flail back and elbow somebody in the face. Right. So it's the it's a domino effect, I guess. Yeah, no, yeah, th this makes sense to me. If replay shows that someone else was like the real violator, you know, yes. I, I, I think this is this is progress. Um, because how many how many times do we see replays and you're like, wait, what? That's on him, you know? And and uh, and it, it, it's clear like the worst foul was on the other guy. So yeah, yeah, I li I like this one. This is the first one where I'm like, nah, dude. A timeout would be able to be granted when a player has possession of the ball even though the player is airborne an example would be a player grabbing a loose ball and calling the, calling the timeout before landing out of bounds so you don't want that guy to get that timeout didn't it used to be like that though you used to be able to do that because like i think and and Fr i think frank cusimano even said this at one point that drew deaner was the nation's leader in calling a timeout while falling out of bounds like that was a total Diener movie. He used to do that all the time. Well, that was that you could have your you had to have a foot down. I think you because I, I, I mean, dude, I feel like this rule has been changed like once every 15 years. Uh, but all I can think about is the Fab Five. Yeah, well, well, he wasn't falling. No, he, out well, of he bounds, was, was he was trapped, he was trapped in the corner. Yeah. But like and like he about was, to pivot yeah. out of bounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, but this one, like, I I don't like it. It's it's too much, like bang bang. Like it's it's too. It's adding another block charge. Like you're just gonna have coaches and players pissed that they didn't get the char the the timeout called. Well, is it just the player who can? Call it has it? to be a player would be grant a, a timeout would uh, be granted when a play. It doesn't say that the player has to be the one calling it because well, what's it does seem like an opportunity for a bailout timeout from the coach. Right, right. But also this this is almost like you're you're getting into NFL. Is it a catch or not a catch territory? Right. Like <laughs> when does the That's player have comparison. possession? Right. Yeah. Until he until any part of his body touches well, anything that is out of bounds. But does he have possession at all? I mean, that's the question, right? It's a, it now you've moved a timeout from a, from a, a black and white, a timeout is a timeout is a timeout to mm. a judgment call. Yeah. Like no, we, I, shouldn't we be taking judgment calls out of the game? I, I think this, I really, I'm going to have to consult some, older people like myself, but I, I think this is the sort of reinstituting something that used to be, 
Um, I thought you were giving me shit for being uh, young and dumb there for a minute. And then I realized, no. oh, you were talking about, you were looking for historical context. No, I, I thought like, you just, were, I, I, I thought I you were swear. dismissing me because I was young. I was like, that's really out of character. I swear you used to be able to do this. I, I really, I really think you could. Um, I just, I guess I just got to officially verify. They probably flip flopped it at some point. I, 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 I'll side with you. I, I'm sure they have. I just, I don't recall it. It does I, make for some ridiculous plays, you know, like like somebody who's way out of bounds and you're just like like trying not to land on the scorer's table or the cheerleaders or it's whatever. Like, it's like and, uh, and, one fall in wrestling. He's like holding his shoulder up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of like Royal Rumble. Uh, save yes. Kind of yeah, moves. it's Kofi Kofi Kingston out here jumping on the table. Exactly. Um, Jesus, that's a real niche. Uh, a little tangent. It is. There. It is. Um. <laughs> there's a, a another uh flagrant issue here and i don't know has this ever happened has anyone has anyone accrued this many flagrant fouls? and if they have what kind of asshole are they i was just gonna say that i have i cannot think of an example of john cheney's temple guy, that this, guy. So they're saying if a player commits three flagrant one fouls in a game the player would be disqualified Look, you can get a flagrant foul in bad luck, right? Like, like just yes. the way you bring down a rebound, not knowing a guy is right over your shoulder, that kind of thing. I've no, I cannot think of a time where somebody's actually gotten three in a game. This is the um, only time I could think of it ever happening. Uh, was the John Cheney sending in the goon versus St. Joe's? Right. But but even that was it three times. Uh, and back then they would just would have been called like technicals yeah i don't know or intentional saint joe's versus temple basketball um oh uh, here we go february 2005 saint joe's now we need the temple um and we need the guy who did fouling i'm not seeing fouls anywhere Hmm. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, he had four. Was it Mark Tyndale? No, wasn't Mark Tyndale. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Sorry, people. For the but you're also talking about somebody who's like intentionally sent in to do that. Yes. And like, yes, this this could be happenstance. Uh, but Zach, I think the next one is probably the one you're most interested in. Dude, I'm excited about this one, man. All right, tell us what it is. Well, it, 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 players can wear any number from zero to 99. And I got to take issue with Torch on Billikins.com because he made Brett Jolly out to be this like Gronkowski doofus. And I certainly don't think Brett Jolly is a doofus. He just is a meme because he made bad basketball plays. And by the way, can we let Brett Jolly live from now on? Can we take him <laughs> off? Can we focus on McBroom? Like, can't, they're, like they're they're from a similar era, right? Yes. I mean, so so like, I feel like if there's a statute of limitations, like if we call it ten years or whatever, it's got to yeah. It's but we're still doing stuff. Okay, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. All right. Um. And and yes. Uh. How how long before sixty nine gets banned? <laughs> or retired, which happens first? Uh, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> so someone wears it and and is a legend. But look, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I always thought like some of the other numbers were kind of dumb. I, I just like some of the, the numbers that NBA players wear now. Um, I don't know. I, I associate, I, maybe it's just like the era I grew up in, but I associate numbers like that with like Wayne Gretzky's the only one who's allowed to do it. Um, and everybody else it seems like, a, I don't know. I feel, feel like a lot of Russian players in like the eighties and nineties when they first started coming over, uh, you picked should... re really high numbers. If the only way you can wear 69 is if your last name is Logan or Preston. I, I'm not, I don't, I want to keep the show family friendly, Zach. I'm just saying, in, unless it's a, unless it's a, a tribute to Bill and Ted, uh, yes. you don't get to wear 69. All right. As long yes, fine, fine. That, that, that uh, works for me. Uh, but uh, what? So, what number would you wear then, if you if you could do anything? Oh man, I, anything like sixty six. I was a big Rick Ankeel fan sure. when I was a kid. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, 66 was like the number I always wanted for baseball, but never could get. Um, so I think I go with that. What about you? And I keep it simple. I like 10. <laughs> I always would have been 10. I just like that. That I thought I would have said 20 or 33. I thought we were going off the rails. No, no, no. That's just not my style. I Zach. thought that was the point of the exercise. Fundamental, sound, solid, reliable, captain. I, I don't appreciate your ruse. <laughs> well, at least, you know, look, hey, we're we're like, I know there are players in hockey and other sports who have gotten like their birth year, like they get their birth year on their jersey. And now we've come back around to the point where that's just going to be a low number. Right. Oh, like, yeah. uh, uh, so now it's, I know it's not as fun, like right? Four and five and six. Right. Well, yeah. can you do o- zero four? I don't think no, you can do no, a you leading can't, you can't. zero. Are you a, do- you're, are you a double zero person? We've had this conversation recently. You're not. No, you're no, not. I do not like double zero. I, lo- I like double zero. As a short no. king, as a short king who also played in goal in soccer, I love double zero. Yeah. Yeah. Get your GPA on your jersey. That's right. <laughs> Oh, asshole. What? <laughs> um, <laughs> it was more like 2.5. All right. All right. All right. I just fine. wear 25. All right. Fine. Um, religious headwear is allowed now, uh, provided safe for competition. This feels like more on the women's side, but I, I don't know. I, again, I'm not up on my world religions. Um, yeah, there, there really isn't, it's just not a yarmulke. Yeah. I mean, um, there was a guy who's close to me in age named Tamir Goodman. I don't know if you remember him. They called him the Jewish Jordan. He was this high school basketball player who was like, um, um, from a, a, one of the more strict sects of Judaism, uh, had to wear his yarmulke all the time. And he was in high school, he was scoring like 45 points a game. He's just an unbelievable player. And he went to Maryland for a little bit in college. Like, he, like he was that level of recruit. Um, but it really did become a con, like a, an, a, an issue because uh, he couldn't play on Saturdays. And it, it was just like, yeah, like with, with college basketball, it's just like not going to work. Um, so it was a whole thing. But he did play overseas in Israel for a long time. And I think he's still over there now running camps. Um, he was a really actually fun player to watch, but, but yeah, like, like just a super conservative, I, I don't know specifically what um, denomination of Judaism, right. That he would have been, uh, but, but that's one from like the late nineties, early aughts that I can think of where he, he was at least in for a little bit in major college basketball, but um, I think, a, I think part, a Jewish school uh, pretty much runs like, NAIA or D3, right? Like there's one that's like killing it right now, right? Yeah, like a yeshiva or yeah, a, I think I, so. I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I'm I'm not really sure, but um yeah, no, I was I'll just I, yeah, it. yeah. No, uh, I, but, I, but, I, I I vaguely have memory of that and I also wondered why, and then I forgot the bot yeah, Shabbos. I, I really think you're right. This is one that you're just gonna see more in the women's game, and I don't think it's probably going to be much of an issue i think there are ways to like tie it with your hair that's just not going to be different than just yeah. long hair so i mean it'll um, be yeah don't, or or like a swim cap or sure. you know something like that but yeah but yeah i think this is fine what, uh, is, makes what, sense. Is, what is this all about i i don't i don't i don't <laughs> And I'm not talking about the headwear. I'm talking about this next one. I'm the next on to the one. Next yeah, one. no, I, I know. Yeah, red and amber lights would be allowed on the backboard. I think this, this is just a simple like, um, the color of the light, like when the shot clock goes off. I think so. This they're is adding a, amber, a, a bigger range of allowable light colors. Is amber technically orange? I, I think that's what they mean in this case. Okay. Right. That now I get it. Okay. Like, I, I don't think it's going to be I was the like, color we've of had like red lights whiskey. on our backboard since we entered Chaffetz. Yeah. Everybody just thinks of it as red. I think this is one like most people, even if they see orange and red half the time, are not even going to notice just because it's just, you know, that, that a tone in that family of colors that goes off when the shot clock does um yeah that seems inconsequential to me and it, it, you know i just included it because the official rules changed it and i thought it was kind of funny 
Uh, Pete, this is very exciting uh, for the show. Um, we are going to release the bracket for the uh, most improved Billiken award. I get, well, just a bracket for the most improved Billiken of all time. And here it is, folks, in all its glory. Yeah, for our YouTube, uh, for our YouTube viewers, this is, I mean, this is why you subscribe, right? This is it right here. We've created a bracket and seeded them one to 22 based on the guys we went over last week um, in our show and over the, all of the suggestions that you gave us uh, came up with seeds, put them in a bracket, a, a, a 22, you know, single elimination, 22 team bracket, basically uh, with a first round sweet 16 and then on the line on down the line to a champion and um <clears throat> i think what we're trying to do here zach is determine like to kind of force uh, you know the people who are going to engage with this are our listeners to kind of think about which player they really think was the most improved over his career and uh i, I kind of like the way the bracket is set up here i think you did your some... you did your best college baseball conference tournament action here like this yeah. bracket is convoluted as shit well 22 is not a, a clean no. number <clears throat> like we talked about last week i thought well why don't we just add 10 more names and make it a clean 32 I, and then it's easy i know how the numbers all work out and uh, i think you were right like we didn't need to add more uh fat here you know we we, we might as well just go with what we have most of these guys got rid of their fat with that's their right. improvement so <laughs> so yeah that's right so so i do have it in um <clears throat> i think in the correct order i mean I'm, I'm looking at this and it's you know it makes sense to me i don't know but it's, it's the i don't think anybody do. would notice if it was wrong so it's the best you can do with 22 and i looked over it a few times and i think i got it right i did it kind of late because i did it after our last show at night but um but i think i got it right in terms of how it would all shake out and what what would play what number um but uh but yeah zach how do you want to do this you, you well, just want to go yeah let's give out the let's just go seed by seed okay. um and uh yeah uh the 22 seed barely making the list mike yeah. mccall jr pete mike mccall and he's got an interesting first round matchup against the 11 seed uh chris sloan yes I the, that's those are two uh fan favorites i feel like two gritty guys like i think all of these guys are gritty but like they, i don't know which way this matchup's gonna go and people have to keep in mind and we're i, I know we're gonna say this as we kind of put out because we're, we're gonna do this in like little polls on yes. our twitter feed like over the course of i don't know how long we're gonna do it but we're gonna do it in, in, starting tomorrow when after the episode drops um, on Twitter, we're going to start putting these matchups out and and having people choose. It's not your favorite player. It's not the best player. It's not the guy who put up the biggest numbers. It's who improved the most over his career. Yes. Um, and then right above that, or do we want to go with who they would play? Um, I, I really don't. I mean, I, let's I, just go up the bracket and then we'll move over. Yeah. Okay. So they to the people that are getting buys. Okay. We'll go, so that, yeah. Then what's our next uh, first round so, matchup here? So we'll have two big men, uh, Chris Heinrich and Rob Lowe. Uh, this is a this is a uh, it's it's a matchup of a a a foreign player and a pseudo foreign player, uh, <laughs> one with full New Zealand citizenship and one with partial German citizenship. Uh, next one up is a uh, a friend of the show and a Billiken legend. Well, it's not, it's actually not a Billiken legend. Oh, sorry, I, sorry. I, he's a he's a very good Jesus, player. I, I I jumped the gun there. I got excited when I put his name in there, Zach. I had that exact same thought. Like, do I need to put the first name in too? But we've got John and clearly, Duff. Clearly, clearly, you proved that idiots will will <laughs> mess this up. Uh, yeah, this is definitely one that we'll will explicitly say in the poll. Yes, uh, we've got yeah, like you said, friend of the show, number fifteen, John Duff against number seventeen, Carlos McCauley. Uh, who I do not believe is the son or grandson of Easy Ed McCauley. Um, next up is uh, 
a Billiken favorite, definitely a fan favorite. Even post grad, he's a Billiken favorite. Uh, Jordi Jet versus John Redden, Pete. Who, by the way, is another fan favorite. <clears throat> I think he showed up in here because he really is that that dude. Like, oh, people love John Redden, and he was one. As I was looking at this, uh, this doing this whole experiment in the first place, he didn't put up huge numbers at all. Uh, but people remember his defense and being just such an essential role player when he was there. Um, it, it's it's it's. I think that's what really got him in this bracket in the first place. So that's an, I like that matchup a lot. To to uh, Colt fan favorites, maybe one more obvious than the other. This next matchup that you're going to announce is going to tear people apart. <laughs> this will be the thing that breaks the fan fan base finally they may be mad people are gonna be mad at the at his seed here number 13 Dwayne Evans against number 20 Jordan Goodwin yeah and, and a, I think people are gonna be upset about that seed for Goodwin uh but they shouldn't be because they are wrong they're just gonna have to deal with it yeah they're gonna have to make their decision and they're gonna have to justify it yes uh we've got Irwin Claggett versus Ryan Luchtefeld, two guys that are still majorly involved in the St. Louis community. Very much so. And in two more fan favorites, um, if if I if I do say so myself. And the Luchtefelds, the only double last name in here, only set of brothers in here. So they're the only ones who have the first initial, um, e even though Carlos will certainly confuse some people. But Zach, the 16 and 18, 16 Luchtefeld, 18 Claggett go on to face some of the toughest competition of their careers. Well, they do. The, the one However, seed. hold hold on. Let's get to the guys that don't have uh that know their know their opponents in the bye. Okay. All right, sure. Um we've got the seven seed and ten seed. Uh Pete, you're gonna have to remind me on first names here. I know that's Rich Name. Oh, it's Jeff Harris. Yeah. Jesus Come on. Christ. Come on. That's your favorite. Well, uh, yeah. He, oh, God. <laughs> he's never going to speak to me again. No, he's done with you. Jeff uh, Harris is the 10. Jeff Harris and Rich Neiman. Rich Neiman's the number seven. So a good, a classic 7 10 matchup. Tough call in the, uh, it's, it's, it, yeah, they, they don't have a play in because they're a 7 and 10, just like the 8 and 9 across the bracket. Um, it's, it's a tough call here, Zach. Neiman and Harris. I mean, seven ten. It's not quite a coin flip in the actual NCAA tournament, but uh, but it's it's certainly a tough call. But the eight nine definitely is, and uh, I don't know if this one this one will be interesting. I can't say if it's a coin flip or I know. Yeah, Vyukas Leonard at the eight and nine with Ian getting the eight seed. Uh, I don't know what do you, what what's your first instinct here? I think Ian. I mean, I think most of my my perspective is from that of like Ian played when I was a kid, when I, you know, my happiest, I guess my most joyous, uh, unworrying memories of Billiken basketball. Right. Like I never, I, I wasn't like, like I loved it, but I wasn't deep into the, just to the knowing uh, yet. So I, I think the Yukas has a special place in my heart, but we'll see yeah, how the and fans vote. And Jesse Leonard, though, is one of those. Like, I think he might be our only representative from the 70s. Uh, he's an early 70s player. And um, I, I think he's one of those, like, if people really do their homework when they're, when they're doing this. Um, Nobody's doing their homework, Peter. Well, you know, th those who they're, remember. They're much, much like me. They're not doing homework. <laughs> th th those who remember him, though, uh, I think he's got a pretty solid case there as a nine. Uh, you know could make some noise in the bracket you never know uh one of the few players on this list that didn't uh uh start at slew uh he is a a, mm. a transfer and he will play the winner of chris sloan and mike mccall jr and that is mo jeffers yeah mo jeffers is the six who will take on the eleven twenty two. so the way this this sets up is that in the sweet 16 it would be like a, an actual ncaa tournament where um any the two highest seeds of any matchup would add up to 17 um so i, I like i said i think i got it right on here but yeah jeffers is the six and uh and sloan would be the uh, the 11 um if he could make it past mike mccall there 
Uh, Mo Jeffers is one, like I said in the show last week, I never would have thought of him as a, as a contender for this. It played just two seasons, and I thought of, in, in, in my mind, they were both great. I had no idea how big an improvement he had from junior to senior year. So, yeah, he's, he's an interesting test case here. This next one is an, uh, an old boys club special, Pete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, we're going, going even further back than we did for Jesse Leonard. We've got Harold Alcorn as the number three, our, and he our... would take on the, the winner of, of 14 seed Rob Lowe and 19 seed Chris Heinrich. A am I influencing this too much by saying, please do your homework when it comes to a player you've never heard of? I, I would hope that people do automatically just because when you see a name like Harold Alcorn and maybe you don't know a whole lot about him, if you're from, you know, our generation, younger, even, even older than me, um, you wouldn't necessarily know a player from the fifties automatically. But I think if you saw him as a three seed, you would go, Whoa, okay. What's this dude yeah. all about? I better go look him up. Um, Playing the uh, winner of John Duff and Carlos McCauley is Mr. Newberry, Pete. Yeah, and that's a name, <clears throat> as we've watched Yuri Collins work his way up through the the, the record book in, in the past four years, Charles Newberry uh, was a, <clears throat> a name there a lot for assists. And that's one of the stats I highlighted last week when we were talking about improvement over time. Um, he became one of SLU's all-time big assist producers and uh, and and really had an impressive arc over his career. So that's a tough one if if uh, for, for either Duff or McCauley, whoever makes it through. Newberry had a really nice steady arc in his career. There's a good reason he's the two seed. Um, Pete, going up against Jet or Redden, it is the second half of the tag team yeah the luchtefeld brothers this one's jeff and uh and i think there's probably a case to be made that he had a little bit more of an overall improvement from where he started than ryan did over his career uh but again <clears throat> real slug fest in the first round of fan favorites jet and red and so uh that's what you know they say that 12-5 is always an upset spot so it's one to keep an eye on and there will be no all Luchtefeld final in this one as they're on the same side of the bracket. They're on the same side. They would meet in the final four should they yes. both advance. Um, my, one of my, another one of my favorite Billikens of all time. I wore the number five in grade school for this guy. Uh, and he'll go up against uh, the, uh, the winner of the Titanic match between Evans and Goodwin. And that's Marky Perry. Holding down the four seed, <clears throat> he's got the four thirteen with with Evans or or the odd four twenty with Goodwin. What um, four twenty? <laughs> calm yourself, Zach. Um, this is one where you look at this part of the bracket, and it's so hard to pick, right? Like you get the the bracket comes out, and I, I say this every year, but like all the teams I like are in the same part. They're all in the same regions. I, I like these teams and these teams, and they're all in the same two regions, and all these teams I don't like are in the same regions. And right here, I'm looking at UCLA and St. Mary's and all those, like the West Coast teams I really like a lot are all in the same little cluster here. But uh, that's just how it goes sometimes. So I can't wait to see how that one shakes out. And that number one seed, Pete, the, the, the guy who gave me this idea, well, he didn't give it to me, but he inspired this idea. Yeah, the 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 mythical uh, Brian Conklin, he of the Conklin summer. Uh, feel bad for Claggett or Luchtefeld having to take him on, and and the legend that is uh, that is his his junior to senior year summer in the in the Sweet Sixteen. But sometimes you know that's just how it goes, and uh, I, I wish them the best because he he's kind of the heavy favorite in that first round. Yeah, this will be fun, and I hope we can uh, tag some of these uh, more um uh current guys and and they can get in on the fun and yeah start uh making their case that would be i could see i could see ryan lochtefeld getting in on it um i could definitely see like a um a jordan jet getting in on it rob Lowe maybe it's, chris sloan is a hundred percent gonna start lobbying <laughs> especially because he was there uh kind of in the same era as mo yeah. jeffers uh, I think they would have overlapped by one year, if I'm not mistaken. So 
Uh, so yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of good potential for uh, for the social media aspect of this thing. All right. Well, now we're gonna move away from basketball here. Uh, actually, we're not gonna move away from basketball. We're gonna move away from men's basketball. Uh, the women's basketball team named a new associate head coach. And, and at first, I thought they hired uh, the old head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, and then I realized I misread the name. Yeah. And Zach, one of the things I meant to do before the show was actually figure out how to pronounce his last name. Colleton. It's Colleton. It's Jimmy Colleton. C O L L O T O N. Um, a lot of O's, a couple L's. All O's. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we, we, we thought, um, I, or I thought, I can't speak for everybody. I thought uh, Rebecca Tillett would go with another assistant, but she's back with the sort of dual associate head coach look for the staff. Uh, when, when Ryan Micheletti moved on to the Slippery Rock job, that left us with one associate head coach left, and I thought we would kind of keep it there. Uh, but no, she's she likes having two of them on the staff. And and I like his background a lot, Zach. I mean, he he um he spent the last nine years at Navy. So he was on staff with her at the same time before she went went to Longwood. Uh before that he was a a grad assistant and assistant coach at Indiana. Um also spent a couple of years in that stretch. Um, I, I think while he was with Navy as a scout for the uh, LA Sparks of the WNBA. Um, he went to Wittenberg College or I guess it's Wittenberg University here in Ohio, where he also started his coaching career as a student assistant. And he's a, he's from the Chicago area. Um, so he, he's, again, he gives us kind of a lot of those geographies that I think make sense for, for SLU as a program. And, and till it kind of like Ford, Zach kind of likes to keep it, uh, keep it close, keep it in the family. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it is interesting. I, again, I, I, I can't, uh, I can't argue with her results, man. Like I would say maybe go with somebody different, but like I go with what works. Um, yeah. Pete, we got some, uh, some bummer news. Um, I mean, we saw it coming. We knew he was transferring, but it's official. Toby Gillen, our, our baby boy, Toby Gillen is heading to Ole Miss. He is, but Zach, I mean, one of the things that you and I talked about here is it was cool to see Coach Bell acknowledge that this was happening. It's probably what's best for him. And then to go ahead and kind of work um, with him on, you know, getting the right fit and doing what was best for him in the long run. I, I, I don't know if it's just because we know Coach Bell a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and we've talked to Toby before and, and things like that, but you don't always get the idea that coaches work this closely with the players who are heading out more. It, it's either more like, well, you know, we're, we're, we're done. So we both move on um, or, or something like that. And, and, and certainly not, <clears throat> not the least bit um, acrimonious in this situation. Uh, he, he really seemed to do right by his player. Yeah. I think that's, it's really rare to see, a coach on the forefront of this process, uh, really making an impact in, 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 you know, helping and guiding the player through the process and uh, kudos to John Bell. And I know we're going to try to get John Bell uh, on uh, once more, um, you know, this season uh, to, to talk about this and, and he's glad to answer any questions. Um, mm -hmm. And we just, just when it, uh, when we can find time, Pete, we're both sounding like rammer after a, a conference road game. You know, <laughs> we're both losing that voice. Uh, I, so a week ago, I, I, I like, I was going on mute constantly to cough. And then um, everybody in my family, starting on our vacation a couple of weeks ago through this week, even to today are still coughing a little bit. I swear the air quality issue, like from the wildfires in Canada. Um, and like, you know, every time you drive by downtown, wherever we're going, like going to St. Louis through Indianapolis, seeing Cincinnati, it's hazy everywhere. I swear it's bothering me. I think it's hazy in my apartment right now. <laughs> oh shoot. No, you know what? I just need to, there we go. You got, you okay. got the jokes today, yeah. man. <laughs> uh, that wraps up. The week that was in Billiken Athletics. Follow us on Twitter at Midtown Mad Pod at Peter is a tweeter. 
at Zach Miller MMP and on Instagram at Midtown Mad Pod. Uh, you know the deal. Subscribe, rate, like, all that good stuff. As always, Pete, go Bills. Go Bills. Thank you.